Well, I think it's really interesting that we're going to be speaking about pain in demyelinating diseases because everyone, uh, for, for, for a couple of reasons. First, um, I was recently having lunch with a fellow neurologist. I am a neurologist by training, and that person actually subspecialized in multiple sclerosis. And what was really fascinating, what was really fascinating, is that if you ask the average person who treats multiple sclerosis, or which is the most likely most common demyelinating disorder, um, so myelin is the fatty covering of the uh, nerve, uh, neuron, um, that allows for fast speeds of electricity to be processed. And demyelinating means that part of that myelin, in this case in MS, for example, it's the central demyelinate, central nervous system demyelin for the most part, um, is um, attacked by an, an autoimmune, by an immune mediated process, leaving gaps in electrical transmission. And that might seem like, well, so what big deal, but that's how we feel things normally when information can get from point A to point B amazingly quickly. And the slowdown of that causes us to feel something abnormal. So getting back to speaking with this colleague who herself is an MS specialist, it was like, well, we've been typically trained to believe that MS isn't associated with a lot of pain. And then she went on to say, but that's not true. And I said, of course it's not true, and I agree. And in fact, a wonderful survey that was done um, through Yale Medical Center, through MS, their MS program, published many, many years ago in Pain, the journal Pain, identified that nearly two-thirds or so of individuals with multiple sclerosis had, by this survey of over a thousand individuals with MS, moderate to severe pain, interfering in their ability to function. So that's kind of a big disconnect when you read a standard MS textbook, it, leaves, it makes pain into a very minor thing, when in fact some people may actually present with their MS with a case of trigeminal neuralgia or some other painful condition and go too long without being diagnosed. MS is the most common demyelinating disorder. There are other demyelinating disorders that can occur, other disorders in which there is demyelination, and so um, it's important to, to recognize the spectrum of demyelinating disorders that can be associated with pain and not to under-recognize that when we see our patients. Well, there's uh, um, the, the spasticity related pain, um, um, pain associated with, with um, uh, 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 spinal cord related uh, plaques, um, um, actually, MS patients can also, or demyelinating people with demyelinating disease, can have pain associated with, uh, can have even radiculopathy because there's an overlap between the central and the peripheral myelin in that nerve root. And so central myelin can be attacked and wind up causing, uh, um, or in that overlap area, being, wind up causing um, radiculopathy as well. The first step, the first step I think always is taking an adequate, is actually listening to the person, taking what they say seriously, um, and planning um, to address what they're hearing in a, in a logical way, um, as opposed to presupposing that it can't, that the, so uh, ignoring that pain may, may, may be experienced. Uh, having said that, um, it, it's important for someone, for a primary care physician, especially to uh, consider whether or not there are other explanations uh, for that person's complaint of pain. And um, uh, it, I think that pain management, as we know, is not just one treatment, it's not one approach. And so certainly a primary care provider can addressed and address initially um, the complaints, maybe institute uh, an evaluation and treatment that is in their comfort zone, um, but should also recognize the need for potential um, subspecialty intervention or evaluation. That could be a neurologist as well as a pain specialist or a pain specialist who happens to be well-versed in neurological disorders. Um, but I think it's important for the, the person to be treated seriously. Um, there's a wide range of treatments that are available. Not everything is medically based, um, but I think that um, 
Um, so for example, in trigeminal neuralgia, which can often be associated with, with um, multiple sclerosis, if that person is started on a treatment, let's say like carbamazepine, which is a, a treatment that's been available in the United States for over 40 years for that condition, um, that may be something that can be instituted um, and monitored, but it may not be the only treatment that's ultimately used. And the idea is not to rest on your laurels, but to anticipate um, that a person may need more and be ready to make that referral. In general, if someone's experiencing not only a chronic illness, let's say like a demyelinating disorder such as MS, and chronic pain associated with that, so, so two related in this instance chronic conditions, that person can benefit from good coping strategies, um, not, uh, methods and approaches to, to um, provide um, um, a, a strong um, cognitive, a positive cognitive approach to the, to, as opposed to um, a catastrophizing type of approach to the treatment. And um, I think that comes in part from forming close bonds with the treatment provider. Um, and um, that, that's, that's very important. Um, I think um, um, other complementary, so-called complementary approaches can be considered, but I'm not sure there's a whole lot of evidence to support that. And even in, you know, even as we talk about um, use of cannabis and, 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 and such, there aren't a whole lot of data. I mean, there is in other parts of the world, Canada and Europe, um, there's a, a, a cannabinoid medication that's been specifically developed and approved um, in those areas for MS-related neuropathic pain. And, you know, that sounds great until you look at the actual outcomes in which barely half the people get a little bit less than half the relief, pain relief that they're looking for. So sure, you're, maybe it's better than placebo, um, but it's not, you know, it's still not leaving those individuals who are using that approach uh, being a, a pain-free state. So it, it is complicated. And there are many treatments that are available now for different, um, you know, MS treatments that are available for different uh, uh, people in, in states. And it's great when you're a responder. Um, unfortunately, um, some people don't respond to even the best available treatments to treat primarily, to treat directly the, the MS. Um, and treating MS doesn't necessarily mean that the pain associated with that MS um, condition in that person is going to help. So in this case, MS now has many treatments that are available to treat the underlying disorder, but MS is different for each, in each person. Um, so certainly treat the treatable, treat what you can, um, but at the same time, uh, realize that even doing so may not necessarily result in a pain-free state.